Hey business students, Professor Seth C. Orenberg here and we're going to talk about how to calculate expected return on investment opportunities and in doing so help understand our clients better and how they're making choices about whether to invest in certain businesses and not others. Let's begin with a very quick description of risk and return. We invest in businesses generally in order to make money. Uh, that would be the return, the amount of profit you can generate from an investment opportunity. But returns from investment in businesses are rarely, if ever, guaranteed. There's a chance the business goes bust and you don't get paid at all. And in some cases, there's also some chance that you might get a much better return uh, than you would hope for. So there is uh, some risk inherent in investing, and so we're going to look at different scenarios to try to understand how that risk plays into our overall return. And we do that by calculating the expected return on investment, or ROI, and comparing that ROI to the next best alternative to see whether or not this is a good investment, uh, to see whether or not it's the best investment for, for us or for our client. Let me give you an illustration. We're going to use the same illustration with some slight variation three times. Meyer is considering investing $100,000 in new venture number one. There is a relatively modest chance, a 25% chance, that the venture will go bust and he'll lose everything. There's a more likely scenario. We estimate a 70% chance that the venture will produce steady profits of $10,000 a year for 10 years for a total of $100,000 in profit. And there's a best case scenario. Uh, even better would be if we sell the company and get a million dollars up front as a lump sum immediately uh, for, for selling the venture in an M&A. So Meyer wants to calculate his expected return on investment, and we're going to use absolute terms, uh, meaning dollars and not a percentage, to keep things simple. And here's how we do it. It's actually pretty straightforward mathematically. We're going to put a chart together where we have our uh, potential outcomes and the probabilities of each of those happening. And by the way, the probabilities need to add up to 100% for this to work because we need to account for all of the outcomes, and, and that means we're accounting for 100% of the possible outcomes that can result from this investment. So one outcome is he goes bust, has a 25% chance of that. 25%, we simply multiply it by the return, which is zero. 25 times zero is zero. Uh, second outcome, this uh, steady profit, for a period of years, there's a 70% chance of it happening, 100000 if it does, resulting in a $70,000 uh, risk-adjusted return. And again, notice we multiplied 70% times 100000 which brought us to 70000 And finally, there's this best-case scenario. It's a low-probability event, but we could potentially get a million dollars for this investment, and there's a 5% chance of that. 5% times a million is 50000 and we simply add those columns uh, together. We add them together in the column and reach a total of $120,000. So that's how much Mayer can expect to get from this investment. By the way, it's not how much he'll actually get. Notice that 120000 is not any of the actual outcomes. It, it represents an amalgamation of all of the outcomes together. It's his total risk-adjusted return. He's going to end up, the company is either going to go bust or go steady or go sale, and he'll get a different return based on that. However, the overall risk-adjusted return is $120,000. So, is this a good investment or not? Should Mayer make this investment? Yes, unless there's a more profitable alternative. Why? Because Mayer's return on investment is positive. He's making money. He's putting $100,000 in and expecting to make one hundred and twenty. dollars so 120,000 return minus 100,000 invested is a $20,000 profit. That's a nice profit. Uh, and so uh, Mayer is better off taking this investment than keeping his money. If he keeps his money, he's guaranteed to have $100,000 in the bank. But he has now uh, an expectation of 120, so he's better off with the investment than the money in the bank. Unless there's a better alternative, unless there's somewhere else he could put his money, that's even more profitable because once he deploys his money into this venture, that's it. He doesn't have the opportunity to invest in somewhere else. So let's look at another scenario and see if it's better. In illustration two, we're going to use similar facts. Mayer is considering investing $100,000 again, this time in new venture number two. 
For New Venture 2, there's a high chance, 90% chance, that the venture is going to go bust. This is a really risky enterprise, and so there's a high chance that the money will be lost, and a small chance, only 5%, the venture is going to produce steady profits. Maybe it's not built for steady profits. It's built for sale. So there's a small chance that this company will sell itself to a larger competitor for a much more significant amount of money of $2.5 million. So again, we're looking at an investment of 100000 but here, much higher chance of total failure. But if we get the upside, if we get the uh, uh, M&A event, if we get the sale, it's a, it's a much bigger reward as well. So what does his ROI look like here? Let's run the numbers again. Three scenarios, bust, set, steady, and sale. Uh, we have to simply plug in the probabilities that we had before. And this may be surprising until we do the numbers, but although there's a huge chance of getting nothing, uh, that 5% uh, opportunity to earn uh, 2.5 million is actually really powerful here. It turns out to drive the math significantly. And 5% uh, of 2.5 million is 125,000. So we can add up the numbers in the column here and find that the risk adjusted return total uh, for, for all three scenarios is actually $130,000. So is this a better investment? So is this a good investment? Should Mayer make the investment in New Venture 1 or New Venture 2? Well, if Mayer is uh, risk neutral, if he's, if he's not particularly uh, risk seeking or risk averse, terms will come back to him in just a minute. If he's sort of, uh, if he's looking at this totally rationally, then he should take the larger expected return. Uh, we simply would compare the expected return for Venture 2, which is 130,000, to Venture 1, which is 120. 130,000 is more than 120,000. But Mayer may have idiosyncratic risk preferences. What if Mayer has a higher or lower risk tolerance than, than usual or than average, and, and why might that be? So we need to talk about risk tolerance and risk preference for a minute. People have different risk preferences, and we can generally describe people as falling into one of three buckets. Uh, risk neutral means they're just taking a straight equation and, and looking at which um, opportunity is going to return the most on their investment. Risk averse individuals, on the other hand, uh, oftentimes are in a situation where they simply cannot afford to lose a lot of money. So in that scenario where there's a 90% chance of going bust, Mayer, if he doesn't have uh, uh, an extra $100,000 lying around, that may be an unacceptably high risk of losing everything. It may be really unwise to take a 90% chance of losing everything because, well, there's a 9 in 10 chance of that happening, leaving you dead broke. So a person that is less wealthy may be more risk averse for that reason and, and therefore would rather have a stable investment, um, even one with a lower return. On the other hand, there are people that you can call risk loving. They prefer to take big chances. They're the gamblers. Sometimes this is because they're wealthy or sometimes it's just a matter of personality and preference. So depending on one's risk preferences, whether one has a preference to be risk averse or preference to be risk loving, one might select an investment opportunity based on those preferences as well as just the straight numbers. Let's look at one more illustration to round out our understanding of how risk preferences can play into our calculation. Now Mayer is considering investing 100000 in new venture number three. There's a high chance, 70%, that the venture will go bust and all the money will be lost. And there's a low chance, 20%, that the venture will produce steady profits of $10,000 a year for 10 years. And last but certainly not least is our, our chance of winning it big, a uh, small chance of a best case scenario where the company sells itself to a competitor for a million dollars. And so now we're going to calculate Mayer's expected return on investment. And as you can see, I, I engineered the numbers deliberately to arrive through the same calculation at the same risk-adjusted return of $120,000. Uh, so let's set aside uh, uh, investment opportunity number two, which did return 130. And as between the two options that returned 120,000, venture one and venture three, which one is better for Mayer to take? Which investment should Mayer make based on his risk preferences? Well, as between Venture 1 and Venture 3, they both had the same expected return of $120,000. However, there are some differences. Venture 3 has a much higher chance of total failure. 
70% chance of total failure. It also had a higher chance of a big return. So we might say that New Venture 2 seems riskier and maybe a less appropriate investment for someone like Mayer if he's not particularly wealthy and is not in a position to lose all that money. On the other hand, if Mayer is a very wealthy individual who has many investments, he may prefer to have some riskier ones in his portfolio so he has a chance at that big upside. Whether Mayer prefers New Venture 1 or New Venture 3 will depend on his risk preference. In conclusion, we're going to use the return on investment calculation to decide whether or not an investment is worth making. And we do this by accounting for all the possible scenarios and multiplying the probability of each scenario times the return from that scenario. In general, investors should pick the opportunity that has the highest overall return on investment when we have accounted for all the scenarios. However, some investors simply can't afford to lose all their money or a lot of money. So they might need to pick a investment with a lower or at least an equal uh, ROI because they're risk avoiding. And meanwhile, there are investors that might prefer an investment that has a high chance of a big return, kind of a swing for the fences af- approach. Even if the return on investment is the same as a less risky investment, they may simply prefer the, uh, the riskier one because it fits into their portfolio. And that is how we use the uh, ROI calculation to understand whether or not an investment decision is wise and is appropriate for the client that we have.